All right, so outside of the plasma, the other main blood component is going to be the formed elements, or a lot of times they call these the cellular components of the blood. When we look at the different types of formed elements, we're really going to see the erythrocytes, which are also known as red blood cells or RBCs. We have the platelets, sometimes also known as uh, thrombocytes. And then finally we have the leukocytes, which are also known as the white blood cells or WBCs. So we can see in terms of the leukocytes, there is going to be a number of different types. And I, when I actually will have a show on the white blood cells as well, we'll talk about the different types here. But you have granulocytes, which have grains in the cytoplasm of those cells. These are going to be your neutrophils, bas basophils, and eosinophils. The granulocytes, they do not have these cytoplasmic granules in the, in the cell, and these are going to be the lymphocytes and the monocytes. So erythrocytes, or red blood cells, what are we looking at here? Well, we are looking at cells that are really, to me, they're tire-shaped. So they have that kind of outer kind of bulge at the top. It will narrow in in the center and then bulge back out. It's what we call a biconcave disc. The shape of this red blood cell and if you don't mind if I jump ahead and jump back for a second here, the shape of the blood cell, you can see the biconcave disc here. You see it kind of goes in in the center and back out. One of the things that this shape allows the cell to do is to actually increase the surface area. So the fact that it kind of indents back in, it, what this is going to do is it's going to increase the surface area. So versus a round cell of the same size, we're looking at about 30% more surface area in that particular cell. What this is going to allow to happen, the more surface area a cell has, the easier, the quicker any type of diffusion, osmosis across that cell membrane is going to occur faster with more surface area. The other thing that we see is there is some uh, components of the cell membrane that allow it to have quite a bit of flexibility. So these red blood cells that buy a concave shape, one of the things that allows to have happen as well is certain blood vessels are quite narrow. I mean, you can kind of think about it like a, if you think like a, the main blood vessels, they're going to be like these big highways where everything's kind of zipping along there. And all of us that live in northern Michigan where I live have probably experienced at one point or another some type of two-track where you got the trees that are kind of coming in from the sides and you can hardly fit your car through there. It's kind of the same idea when we're looking at the red blood cells. When we get down to these smallest capillaries, it is like a one-lane, two-track type of road where you got the branches and everything kind of coming in there and hitting the blood cell. By having this kind of roundish but kind of indented shape, you can get that flex back and forth, and it is going to allow it to be able to squeeze through these smaller blood vessels where if we had a rounder shape, it would get in there and kind of get stuck. The other thing, if we were to look at the pictures again, that you don't see on this cell that you see in almost all other cells is going to be a nucleus. So we would say red blood cells are a nucleate. So this means a number of, means a couple of different things for us at least. First of all, if you don't have any nucleus, you're not going to divide. So these cells are not dividing, no cell division taking place. These are not, we're not going to make an adult or fully mature red blood cell is not going to make more red blood cells. They actually all come from stem cells in the bone marrow. Another thing that this means is that, especially with uh, other missing organelles and along with the other mitochondria, no presence of mitochondria, it means that these cells are going to have a shelf life. So we'll kind of see it on a different one here, but the shelf life on a red blood cell is about 120 days. The fact that they don't have a mitochondria is also a good thing in that they can't use up any of the oxygen that is bound to them that they're supposed to be carrying around. So they only generate any ATP that they need anaerobically and preserve that oxygen for delivery to the cells. Main thing that is in these red blood cells in 90%, 90, over 90%, so like it says there, about 97% of the entire content of the cell is filled with hemoglobin. And hemoglobin, what it's going to do is it binds up oxygen and allows us to move oxygen throughout the body. So of the four nodes, this is the most numerous one, like we said, about four to six million cells per cc or per microliter. Then again, the main thing they do is they're going to be moving the respiratory gases around. And it's through this molecule called hemoglobin that is going to bind this oxygen. And one of the nice things about hemoglobin is it does, like it says there, binds the oxygen reversibly. What this means is we wouldn't want 
oxygen, I mean, and this is something I was actually asked my classes in person, is do you want hemoglobin to kind of grab onto the oxygen as strongly as possible? And a lot of times they'll say, that, yeah, we want it to grab onto it quite well. And there's only one problem with that idea, and that is the idea that if oxygen in the environment and it grabs onto it really well, that's great. It gets it out of the air and gets it into our bloodstream. But these same cells have to be able to let go of this oxygen when it gets out to the tissues. Otherwise, all we're going to have is blood cells that are, do a really good job of binding up oxygen but don't deliver it to any other cells that actually need it to survive. So what we're going to see is oxygen that kind of has this mid-range kind of affinity or binding strength of oxygen where it can grab onto the oxygen, but when it gets to areas that are lower in oxygen, it will let the oxygen go to other areas. So hemoglobin is the molecule that carries the oxygen. It is made up of two parts. Not surprisingly, we have a heme region and a globin part. And we're going to see this is a protein that has that fourth level or quaternary level of structure. So multiple chains bound together. So we have these two alpha and two beta chains. And within each chain, we have a heme group, which at the center of that is an iron molecule. And it's at this iron molecule that uh, oxygen is bound. It's the active site of basically the hemoglobin enzyme. And we can, you can kind of see it right here. So you can see that we have this overall hemoglobin molecule right here, and each chain has its heme group in the center there. And at the center of each of those heme groups is that iron molecule. And this is part of the reason that they always kind of say, at least with anemia, one of the things to make sure of is do they have enough iron in their diet, or are they iron deficient? Because one of the ways you have decreased oxygen carrying capacity is to be deficient in iron. So when we have the hemoglobin bound to oxygen, we call it oxyhemoglobin. When it doesn't have oxygen bound to it, we call it deoxyhemoglobin. The other thing that hemoglobin can do is it can also bind. It's one of the ways that carbon dioxide is carried in the blood. So this one's a mouthful to say, but when you have it carbon dioxide bound to this, it's carbamine hemoglobin. And it actually binds to a different part of the hemoglobin molecule. So what this means to us is that technically hemoglobin can be carrying oxygen as well as carbon dioxide at the same time. And to kind of give you an example of something that a lot of people are familiar with this, which is the idea of carbon monoxide poisoning, this kind of gives you the idea if hemoglobin did bind oxygen too strongly, what would happen? So carbon monoxide actually binds to hemoglobin with a much higher affinity than oxygen. It's about a 200 times stronger binding with hemoglobin than oxygen does. And the reason why this is so dangerous is the fact that if you get enough carbon monoxide bound up in your blood, what this is going to do is it actually takes up that bonding site, and when oxygen goes to get in there, it can't push that carbon monoxide off. And that's why this can end up being fatal, is that you get enough carbon monoxide in your bloodstream, you cannot bind any oxygen from the environment and therefore cannot deliver it to the tissues. No oxygen is going to lead to cell death. Really. If you get enough of this in your system, it really doesn't matter what they do. One of the things they can do is try to give you oxygen under pressure, which is a hyperbaric chamber, and try to force more oxygen in your bloodstream. And this is one of the ways you can treat it if it's not too severe. But too severe carbon monoxide poisoning will be fatal all the time. So now we've kind of said what the erythrocytes do and kind of how they carry this oxygen. What we need to look at now is we've already kind of said these have a shelf life. It's about 120 days. Because of this, we are going to continuously have to make more cells. So the overall idea of producing more blood is what we call hematopoiesis. If we look specifically at red blood cells, we call it erythropoiesis. Pretty much the formation of all the components of blood takes place in the red bone marrow. And like it says below here, you're looking at about 100 billion new cells a day in terms of red blood cells that are made. So erythropoiesis, it is going to be controlled by pretty much hormones. And this hormone is the main organ that's going to release it is the kidney. So the hormone we're going to refer to is erythropoietin. A lot of times we abbreviate this EPO, actually an endurance uh, kind of event. So things like cycling, especially the Tour de France, this has been a widely used performance enhancing drug because it will increase the number of red blood cells. So EPO, it is going to be reduced, released by the kidney and by, at a smaller level, the liver, pretty much if a few things happen. So 
If you're hypoxic, meaning low oxygen, due to either you don't have enough red blood cells or you had some type of red blood cell loss in terms of hemorrhage or something destroyed your red blood cells, you would release EPO to try to get the, stimulate the bone marrow to produce more. If you move from, say, sea level up to Denver, where you're a mile above sea level, there's less oxygen in that air. When we actually talk about the respiratory system, I'll get into a good description of why this is the case, but there's less oxygen in the air. If you have less oxygen available to you, you're going to try to produce more red blood cells in order to make up for that. It's basically the same idea if you've ever seen any show where people are going to climb Mount Everest. They don't just show up at the pretty much Mount Everest the first day and kind of say, let's go to the top. They live up there for a little while. They go up and down, up and down. What this is really trying to do is produce a large number of red blood cells to allow them to really get as much oxygen as possible from that really oxygen deficient air. Finally, the other way you can stimulate EPO, and this is the basic idea of any kind of endurance training, is you exercise and use more oxygen. That's going to stimulate your body to make more red blood cells to bind up that oxygen so it can deliver it to your tissues more efficiently. And when we get more red blood cells, so when we go through erythropoiesis, what this is going to do is going to increase our red blood cell count. And when we do that, it is going to, as long as we're making good hemoglobin, it is going to increase our ability of our, pretty much our bloodstream to carry oxygen. So what this is going to kind of show you here is the, uh, pretty much what happens here. So you can see in this case here, if normal levels are fine, nothing's really going to happen. But if we somehow get too little of oxygen in the bloodstream, this is going to be detected by the kidneys. So like it says here, hypoxia due to decreased red blood cell count, decreased availability of oxygen, or increased demands of oxygen. What this means is we have a state where we don't have enough oxygen in our blood. Our kidneys recognize this, and the kidneys as well as the liver to a little bit lesser extent are going to release EPO. EPO is going to go and act on the bone marrow and stimulate the stem cells in there to make more red blood cells, which is going to increase the ability of the blood to carry oxygen, which will then again be monitored by the kidneys. And if it's in range, just like any other negative feedback mechanism, this is going to get stopped and shut down. If it's not within range yet and we still need more, this will continue. And again, just getting the EPO isn't enough. We do need certain things, so things like iron, B12, folic acid, all these things are required in order to make that hemoglobin and to make these red blood cells. So if you're deficient in any of these, you are also going to struggle to make functional red blood cells and replace the ones that you're actually needing. And again, a lot of times with women, this ends up being a bigger deal in the sense that menstruation, that monthly loss of blood, really does put a larger requirement on women's systems for these dietary components because they are having to make red blood cells more often because each month they do lose a certain volume of blood. And this, again, goes a little bit through some of the stuff we already talked about already. So with that whole feedback cycle of the erythropoietin, EPO, so it's kind of showing you some of this up at the top here. So low oxygen levels, erythropoietin rise, all this. But the other thing it gets into is, again, our blood cells, because they have no nucleus, because they have no organelles, they don't repair themselves, this means they have about a 120-day life cycle. And red blood cells, to me, are a lot like people in that when you're first born, and those of you who have had kids will experience this, I have actually four kids at home. When they first come out, I always kind of joke around with my classes, they're foldable. Babies been bend up in there for months on months, so babies generally to start out with are quite flexible. As you get older and older, and as you start reaching my age and older, you have a tendency, unless you really work at it, to become less and less flexible. And this is basically what happens with these blood cells as well. As they age, that flexibility to get through these tight spaces and other stuff like that decreases, and at some level or another, going through the spleen or the liver, they get through these really tight places, and the blood cells trying to kind of squeeze through there, and as it kind of does it, it's like, oh, I'm not going to make it, and they pop. And really what happens then is what it's kind of showing you right here, that hemoglobin and certain parts of this are going to be broke down and recycled and pretty much gotten rid of out of the body. So hemoglobin, the globin portion gets broken down. We use it for different amino acids. That heme group, the iron, we're going to pretty much recycle the iron. Certain parts of that heme group, though, they are going to become that bilirubin, 
which is going to be lost to the liver as pretty much the bile. It's the main coloring component of the bile. And so we get rid of a lot of that that way. So that's really kind of the life cycle of a red blood cell and what happens with it. You can have some different disorders with red blood cells. So one of the things, if you are not necessarily oxygen deficient, but you have abnormally low oxygen carrying capacity, this is what we refer to anemia. A lot of times people kind of put anemia together with iron deficiency. That is one type of anemia. Pretty much you don't have enough iron to make the functional hemoglobin, but anemia overall is a decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So it could be you don't have enough red blood cells, you don't have enough hemoglobin, or you have abnormal hemoglobin, such as what happens with sickle cell anemia or some of the thalassemias, which are pretty similar to sickle cell anemia.